Hey there, G3 XE here, and today uh, we're going to be doing a post mortem uh, for my D&D campaign that uh, finished Malam's Maze. Now, I'm going to be doing this video assuming that uh, you've seen the videos leading up to this kind of explaining um, the background to Malam's Maze and it details the entire adventure so you can run it in your Dungeons and Dragons game as well if you'd like and feel free to modify it however you see fit. Um, so this video in part is going to just detail what happened in my campaign and then uh, also talk about my thoughts on what I would change uh, just based on experience from running this adventure. Uh, while I do that I might draw right here on this little card. So, um, so Malam's Maze the adventure regarding a bounty put on the head of Pyroth the Bloody, a young red dragon who has taken up residence in an abandoned castle to the north of the town of, uh, of Falcrest or Fellhaven. And, um, the people, uh, the Lord Warden of that area sent out a bounty for the dragon's head, and everyone knows that castle because it used to belong to an old wizard named Malam, um, who uh, went mad. And there's a whole video describing all that. So essentially, essentially delve into the, or, you know, travel north, battle the orcs that are under the dragon's control, delve into the castle, and then slay Pyroth and take his head. So, um... Really classic D and D adventure. My overall starting out goals for this adventure were to. Uh, I had uh, a few. I had like uh, three people uh, who were completely new to Dungeons and Dragons playing in this campaign, and I wanted something very classic so that they got the authentic kind of D and D classic D and D um, experience. Now. Um, I played with, let's see, there were about five players who were there just about every session, and it took about seven sessions, um, so a little longer than I expected, but um, then there were like two or three that came and switched in and out for certain sessions. But, um, so for a character creation, well, everyone started at level three, and I'll kind of describe the characters who were the mainstay, and then some also characters who joined in. And that's just because I go to college, and I'm very fortunate in that I have a, you know, a, a large pool of people who are interested in playing D and D and stuff. However, um, it does mean that people are quite busy, and that schedules are often hard to uh, get to align. So sometimes it's harder to, uh, you know, get everyone there. But that being said, I would prefer to run a game with three players and one DM. That's my like most comfortable. Um, I feel like most tables fit four people nicely, like a small table, and it's, I don't know, um, eight, at, at, the, at a certain point we had eight people at a table, which we went to a friend of mine's house who had a table big enough for that, but I mean that was a little too big, and that one went late, and it, all we did was essentially one little bit of social interaction and one combat encounter, and that was the whole night, just because of how many people were there. Let's get into it. So, um, the players start out in Fellhaven, and if you'll, as you'll recall from the Fellhaven video, I laid out a lot of different things that they could do in Fellhaven, and I actually drew up a very detailed map of the city, because I expected them to do uh, a lot of screwing around uh, in the city. Um, they didn't do that. <laughs> so the starting players, and the players who were there the most, we had... Um, uh, Torum Vostra. Torum Vostra, and then I'm going to be doing the, the character names, excuse me. Uh, Torum Vostra was a human rogue. Now, the player who played him, very cool guy, first, uh, you know, j met him just through this D&D session, but he was, I mean, he just, uh, always came prepared, always had his dice and his rules and, and memorized, and he had a cool PDF version of character sheet that he kept updated, as well as a physical version, and, um, he, uh, he's actually a, a, a writer, 
and is currently working on his own kind of fantasy book. And so his character was a main character from that book. And so Torum was a human rogue and was actually uh, an assassin. Uh, he's like a diplomat, quote unquote, but his government sends him out to different countries to essentially perform uh, covert operations for them. Um, so he was a very cool character. We fit him into the campaign saying that this area of, that the Lord Warden governs is quite uh, plentiful in lumber and other natural resources. And because the, his country needs those resources for a war that they're fighting, um, th he sent over this um, diplomat to kind of see any way they can convince the Lord Warden to, to send them aid and uh, ally with them. And so he's thinking that if I can slay Pyroth, this dragon that's terrorizing the Lord Warden's countryside, then he will, you know, uh, feel more sympathetic to the cause. Then there is um, Jessen. Jessen is a, a homebrew race, or not homebrew, it was from a wiki, but um, it's not in the player's handbook, but a nymph. However, he wore an amulet that disguised him as an elf, and he was actually a forest nymph from the forests to the west of the town of Fellhaven. And the dragon's ash and sulfur have had been corrupting the woods. So he, um, his, like, pond and, and other areas in which he usually stays around had started to become polluted. So he had come to investigate it, but nymphs can't walk around in their nymph form because people will, one, either want to, like, think that they're... They, they have, like, powers where if they're seen, like, people fall in love with them, and they're intrinsically magical beings. So, a kind of compromise for him being in the party was that he was secretly a nymph, and I was the only one as the DM who knew. But, um, he looked like an elf, and they share a lot of similar characteristics, so that was really interesting. Then, oh, and he was a cleric druid multiclass, um, and, uh, was mainly a healer. Then we had Liland. Liland was a tiefling woman uh, who is a, another cleric, but like a war cleric, of Talos the Storm God. She washed up, uh, this is her backstory, she had washed up on a, a shore as a child next to a uh, temple of Talos, and the people there decided that they would sacrifice her because she was a tiefling and of demonic blood, to Talos, and right before they sacrificed her, lightning struck the temple, and they took it as a sign that Talos wanted her alive and didn't want her to die. So she was raised at that temple as a cleric, and she's always kind of had to prove herself more because she's a tiefling and no one really trusts her or, you know, is unsure of her background. So because of that, she's really uh, dedicated to Talos and praise every night and everything like that. And uh, she wanted to kill Pyroth and sacrifice the red dragon to Talos as that would be an ultimate offering. Then we had Finn, who was a um, dwarven ranger. And he uh, was a kind of, if you imagine, a, a British safari um safari gear clad british dwarf who was you know hellbent on hunting the wildest uh, um creatures around and he was always like ah i do say i'll slay that beast you know and uh the the guy who played him was really good at doing the voice and role playing he was really funny he was kind of a comic relief character and his um the running joke became that he would always get the last blow on a monster, so Finn, his character, would take credit for killing it, even if he, everyone else does it, but, like, it just so happened, based on the way the game played out, that, like, most of the time, Finn got the killing blows, and, uh, he didn't get the f killing blow for Pyroth, but he was very close, and it was really funny. Um, so, that is, oh, and, um, Akko. Akko was a, another tiefling woman, 
who was a monk who had lost her arms. And the player wanted to be really mysterious about the backstory of Akko. Um, and so I'm not really sure how she lost her arms, but um, she was had practiced and been so proficient using her feet that he, she could actually just be a very powerful fighter just by kicking and uh, and using her monk abilities, which was also a super cool um, backstory. And uh, her, her backstory kind of tied into Pyroth and the orcs and stuff, but it was also kind of mysterious. And uh, um, I think his, that was a character that he had different backstory from a different campaign or something going on. And I'm not really uh, perfect on the details, but um, so that was basically the main state of the party. We did have uh, two players join in randomly for certain sessions. One of them was a gnome ranger who had a gorilla um, using the ape stats in the back of the monster manual as her beast companion. And so she rode the gorilla around. And then um, there was a dragonborn uh, warrior fighter um, who just kind of popped in for a session. So, um, that was the party, and they, contrary to what I expected, they did not stick around Fellhaven at all. They shot out of there immediately, thinking they wanted to get as soon as the stars they could. They did buy some supplies, but that was about it. And I was like, oh, okay, I guess we're just bypassing all this other stuff. But, you know, as, a, you know, DMs, you shouldn't railroad, so I was like, all right, well, they're going to the woods. So I had some random tables and everything. Set up. So the first night, uh, well, they essentially travel up north, and nothing of too consequence happens. But they do experience some really bad weather, and are attacked by a, a warband of orcs dedicated to Pyroth, uh, who say in Orcish, you know, for the Dragon King, and they have red paint. Now they didn't know that they were they were servants of the Dragon, and no one spoke Orcish, so they just were kind of confused by that. Or at least didn't connect it to Pyroth immediately. Um, and then the one thing that happened of note is that they came across another adventuring party. And that was the rival adventuring party. And the character I came up with was named Tobor the Mighty. Now Tobor was a half-orc who wore gaudy armor. And was a, a fighter. And was terrible. <laughs> he sucked at everything. But he had the best armor and was very full of himself. And so when they met with Tobor... Um, he kind of bragged about how he's really stupid too, and and they essentially got to talking with him, and he was bragging about where that how they had found a secret way in through the mine, and that you know oh it's far dangerous I wouldn't you you guys wouldn't last a second in there me and my adventuring party are going through or whatever well wouldn't you know it later on his adventuring party is being attacked by orcs and it's like should they intervene or just leave and they decide to intervene and help. Killed the orcs, saved Tobor, so Tobor's now with them. All his friends are dead. And um, Tobor kind of stayed around to the end. He became kind of like a... Just, uh, they kept him around because he spoke or orcish, and there were a lot of orcs. And uh, But he, he was, you know, always very brash. And he was a fun NPC for me to play, especially because he's bad. So it allowed the characters to feel very cool. Especially when he would like screw things up and they'd be able to come in and, and um, fix it. So, um, what else? Okay, so they get so they decide to split the party, which I know is a s strange decision, but they want to see what the front of the castle is like, and they send a, a, most of the party down into Crumble Mall to go into that other passageway. Well, Akko and the gorilla beast companion, because it can telepathically communicate with the gnome, Hunter, head to go do reconnaissance at the front of the thing, while the rest of the party and Tobor go to the um, Crumble Maw. Now, um, while they're at Crumble Maw, uh, Akko and the gorilla concoct a plan, or essentially Akko concocts a plan, that they're going to have the gorilla pretend to be an orc, taking Akko in as prisoner so they can infiltrate the encampment that's outside of the the castle. 
and uh, <laughs> this goes slightly okay. Like they they are convinced that um, the gorilla is an orc, but Akko gets put into this like prisoner pen and essentially is like beaten up and and lost a lot of hit points and not treated very well. Which I was kind of like, I mean, you are going in and pretending to be a prisoner, offering yourself up to these orcs as a yourself as a prisoner. So, um, but uh, that was fun, especially because uh, one of the players knows American Sign Language. So, the way gorillas in real life often can communicate for like if they're thirsty or whatever is through American Sign Language. So, that that was how kind of um, th the gorilla was able to communicate. His name was Thorak, the gorilla specifically. Meanwhile, although they do eventually gain access, but Akko is put into this prison. Meanwhile, in Crumble Maw, they head down into the first layer with the skeletons, and chaos ensues. That was the big battle that took, like, three hours or whatever, because they didn't get the, the skeletons kept respawning based on that uh, core thing that, of necromatic alchemical juice that was respawning them. And so they just kept fighting. They're like, oh, there, there's more of them. And I kept being like, this thing glows gr bright green again. And f and the skeletons you just killed rise from the dead. And they were, and I was just saying, just smash the green thing and they'll stop regenerating. But no one did. It took forever. And a lot of people like got knocked out. And I was like, holy crap. But um, it was kind of funny. And uh, one of the more f funny things was uh, the... Uh, the guy playing the dwarf hunter wanted to ask me if there could be a blunderbuss for his weapon. I said, sure, and I made up some uh, schematics of weapons that he could create through different ingredients that he might find during the adventure. One of those was a grenade, and so he picked up a lot of ash from the area around the castle, because Pyroth is a red dragon, sulfur, and saltpeter. Um, or not ash, charcoal, sulfur, saltpeter, I believe. Whatever it is that makes gunpowder. And he had created a crude grenade. And so he decides to throw this grenade over into the skeletons. And, like, I straight up told him after he confirmed that's what he wanted to do. I was like, okay, well, you're in a cave system a cr known as Crumble Mall Mine. So I'm going to roll this dice. And, like, on a certain number, like, the whole mine starts to collapse. And f fortunately it didn't. It got close. So the mine was, like, rumbled. And everyone's like, stop throwing grenades. And they're like, don't do it. And he, don't throw those anymore. And he's like, oh, ah, you know, I've thrown... Ten grenades, you know, I've killed a, a lot of creatures with grenades in my day. And, uh, they're all like, we're in a mine, don't do that. Um, and it was, it was quite funny. Uh, but eventually they figured it out, and Torum shot an arrow and broke that, um, core text thing that was respawning the skeletons. They went down, then fought the basilisk, and that was a different session, but... Um, one of the characters, the, the nymph disguised as a elf got turned to stone. And, uh, it was kind of a joke because the girl who was playing Liland really wanted to know what she could, she could tell that, um, that the player playing, uh, Jessen wasn't really an elf and she wanted to know what he, what his real race was. And she kept guessing and she's like, you're a drow, aren't you? And he's like, no, not a drow. She's like, okay. And she, the whole time she, we were joking about how she like thought he was a drow. And uh, so he gets frozen, but he's frozen in elf form. And um, um, and uh, oh no, I'm sorry. He's not frozen in elf form. He's frozen because what he did was he um, took off his amulet. And because they had split the party even more in Crumble Maw, and while the other ones were on the top level, they were down there fighting the Basilisk, and he took it up to try and blind the Basilisk because there was this ability um, that the nymphs have from that thing, and Basilisks can turn you to stone based on looking at you, so that was why he was trying to blind him. Either way, it failed, and he kind of failed the eyeball battle, which we did roll for it. Like, you know, I, I really wanted him to win, but he got turned to stone as a nymph. And so they quickly had to hide him. The other friends did because they knew that Lilin was coming down and they didn't want her to see what he actually was just because out of fun. And it worked out too, because of course the alchemist is down there in Crumble Maw and he has a remedy for 
being turned to stone. They they actually ended up killing the alchemist because he was threatening them, and um, they battled the tunnel worm after that, which was um, easier than I had anticipated, but still fun. And just for grins, I threw in that while they were looting the alchemist place, they found a few potions of eternal dancing or something like that. And essentially, if you f keep failing these uh, will saves or uh, wisdom saves, you um, you just are compelled to dance. And they had a lot of fun with that, you know, and then a certain DC. So they, I think they tried it on Pyroth, but he just kind of easily passed the DC. But um, they did it on the alchemist and... It was just kind of a, <laughs> a funny thing I threw in, because that's the kind of game we play. It's very casual and and uh, lighthearted. So, um, they got through that. Then they got into Py or, uh, uh, the, the castle itself and found the prison where Akko was being held. The gorilla was nowhere to be found, but it was actually because uh, the, the hunter, the character playing the hunter had left, um, we, you know, decided that she had left the party or whatever, like, she was like, okay, I'm done, I'm done here, uh, like, oh, this is too dangerous, like, that's what her character said, really, in reality, she was just busy with work, but, um, it, uh, happened that, you know, the gorilla wasn't really available either way, so I guess the gorilla became part of the orcs, but then at the end came back and was like, oh, okay, I'm not an orc and I'm all right, and it was all resolved. But because she wasn't there, it was just Akko that they found. This is kind of the things you have to do when you're DMing a large group and people can't show up certain dates. It's easier if you just roll with the punches. So, um, they free Akko, who's a little bit hurt, but they heal her. Jessen does some healing. Um, and they head to a, base, a basement. Uh, or They go through the basement floors and the dungeon floor. And then they go through the maze and battle uh, Malam's Minotaur. And uh, that was pretty cool, especially because one of the guys, and I may have said this in the other video, but it was really funny, to me at least. They were in the maze, and they were trying to figure out a way to mark where they had been. And of course, like, they have chalk, and they have charcoal. Like, there's lots of ways where they could sprinkle coins or any any side type of thing, like Hansel and Gretel, but he had some meat that he had t taken from one of the loot things. I said, and there's some meat, some some rations. And it was Torum, and Torum had taken that, and he's like, oh, I know, I will put the meat on the ground and, like, slide it so it'll, like, it's, it's raw meat, so it'll have, like, a bloody trail, and that's how we'll get back, which I thought was really strange. And, he's, and I was like... Okay, so how are you going to do it? And he was just like, I'm going to tie a rope around it and drag it behind us. And, of course, Minotaur is having a super keen sense of smell. So I'm like, okay, sure. And then, of course, Minotaur immediately finds them because it's, it's, like, following his thing. And he just barely is able to untie it before the Minotaur grabs it and yanks him back toward him. Either way, the Minotaur ended up goring Torum and took him down to one hit point in that one just devastating gore attack. And that was kind of intense because they were in a little hallway and they had to like scoot him back and then battle the Minotaur. It was quite a, quite a scene. But that was very fun. Then they solved the, um, it was actually Finn who solved the puzzle of the door. Um, and uh, that was fun because, you know, everyone else was like questioning about what it was and Finn's character sitting in the back. And then his player actually figured it out and was like, oh, it's this. But the way Finn, his character, did it was like, well, let me see here. Let me give it a try. And he's just uh, doing a random things. He's like, yes, that, that'll work. And they're like, Finn, that's not going to work. And then, of course, it opens and Finn's like, ah, you see, I've done this many times. So, of course, you know, the comic relief character. That was fun. Um, so they avoided the gargoyles. They avoided the spider. They avoided the tome spirit, too, because they came in from the bottom and then went through the hollow, which I've described in other episodes, and um, that's how they r were going to get to Pyroth. And it kind of cut some of it short, but it was fine because we were already going like more sessions than I expected, so I was like, all right, that's fine. Um, and But they did see the orcs and make a somewhat alliance with the 
uh, with New Gut or Young Gut and the other like orcs who aren't on the side of Pyroth. Now they didn't convince them. They didn't roll well enough to convince them to join them in the fight, but they did become allies. And after the fight, Tobor the Mighty actually became their new tribal leader, um, because Tobor took all the credit for the kill. Ah, oh, yes, I slew it, and you know. Um, by the way, Tobor also got turned to stone by the Basilisk, and they had to un unstone unpetrify him. And it was a kind of actual decision about should we unpetrify him because they really didn't like him. But it was kind of one of those moral decisions where they're like, okay, well, if we're playing good characters, <laughs> we kind of have to do this. Um, but uh, that was funny. And um, then the... I'm trying to think. They played some games with those orcs, just uh, like while they rested. They fought an ooze. Um, and then eventually they got to Pyros Lair, and that was a fun, fun battle. That was a whole session of just battling Pyroth. We left it right when they were going to open the doors, when the next session would pick up. And, uh, boy, it was, it was really fun. Um, Akko, at one point, jumped onto the, the monk, jumped onto the uh, Pyroth's back, and Pyroth is trying to, um, shake her off. Meanwhile, Liland is saying, look, I have this awesome spell that's going to deal a bajillion damage. Get off Pyroth. And Akko's like, well, I'm already on here. And I'm like, we're flying up in the air now. And it's like a 40 feet drop. Like, it was really confusing. And she was trying to shoot her spell, but it would have hit Akko. And it was kind of just like, it It was funny because, you know, you got to work as a team. And, and they were just with that many people, it was kind of chaos. But because they had a lot of players, it they kind of... Um, took over the action economy, so the fight was pretty safe. Um, at one point, one person took 76 fire damage um, and got pretty close to dying or to being knocked out, but no one, I don't think anyone fell during that battle. Um, the gorilla, actually, uh, who had come back, fell but was healed by, by um, Jessen. And then they kill it and uh, was... You know, I believe they, like, taunted him because he was going to fly out, but then they, like, um, chat, you know, like, played on his uh, hubris to 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 get him to come back down again. Uh, Pyroth, I mean. But, um, yeah, in the end, it, it worked out, and uh, everyone was really happy with the loot, and uh, Liland got the final kill, and she blessed, or, you know, was like, for Talos, you know, and sacrificing it to Talos, which is cool for a character. Of course, Finn got part of the dragon and, like, his horn and teeth and stuff and took it back to the Hunter's Guild as, like, proof that he was this dragon slayer. And Jessen barely took any of the gold because, I mean, he's a nymph and he doesn't really have any use for it. And beyond that fact, he's half-druid, which they can't even touch metal. And he was just happy that the um, forest had been cleansed. Uh, Akko, you know, took some money. And obviously Torm, who was the rogue and was the kind of devil. If if Liland was the good, the cleric, um, and, and Jessen, the other cleric, were the good angel on the shoulder, he was the <laughs> bad angel on the shoulder because he was like... He was like uh, always like, well, it'd be easier if we just killed him. I don't have any qualms with that. And they're like, we, we can't do that um, regarding any of the problems they encountered. So, uh, and he, of course, took some gold. And in the end, everyone seemed to really like it. A lot of, uh, I got a lot of feedback from the players who had never played before, and they were like, oh, I really like D&D. &D. We should do it some more. And so that's always heartening. I love hearing that. I love hearing that uh, from new players that the, who didn't really have a good idea of what D and D was that they now are really like it, and I think that at least right now while I have I'm in college, that's kind of my niche is getting people who aren't really into D and D to come play, and that I, I've done it for one shots, and that's probably the easier way to do it. But um, I was glad that I made a lot of on the call on the spot decisions that. Probably didn't go exactly with the 5th edition rules, but felt fun at the time. For instance, uh, 
knowing how to do um, when the Minotaur had grabbed um, uh, Torum by the waist because he was tied to that rope and him trying to untie himself, or when the nymph was trying to do its its uh, uh, gaze attack, essentially, it's, un, it's like its beauty is so radiant or whatever, versus the basilisk's eyes. Like, that was also, like, I, I didn't want to go reading through books, and so we just kind of picked a fun mechanic and roll for it. And it adds a lot of fun to the game. Things that I would change, though, let's see. Um... I think that Malam's castle itself needs to be fleshed out a little bit more. I did random rooms, and it kind of just felt um, lackluster. But then again, it's like, I don't really know how to do a... Because one of the things that I was told at the end was like, well, it wasn't that mazy. And I was like, yeah, it, it should have been more like a maze. Um, it wasn't too labyrinth-like. Um... I did like having the different bosses in different places based on which way they wanted to go, but it felt kind of lame that I didn't get to use the Tome Spirit or the spiders or... I don't know. Um, but then again, you're never going to get to use all of the stuff you prepare, obviously. Um, I also think there should be some other incentive to do stuff in the town. Perhaps tying characters' backstories to that town may help with that, because none of, our, none of my campaign's characters were connected to Fellhaven in any way, and that probably lent itself to them just, like, you know, heading out straight away, just buying supplies and that's it, because um, they didn't have, like, any... They didn't, you know, if they don't have, like, a grandma who lives in the village, then it's not, I guess, as pertinent that they kill Pyroth. Although everyone did a good job in having a reason they wanted to kill Pyroth. It was just no one had the, what I would assume would be the gimme reason, which is I'm from Fellhaven. I'm a, you know, a, a farmer's son who's always dreamed of adventure. This is my chance. That was kind of what the adventure is built for, and, I, and no one really played that. But, you know, uh, what else would I change? Um, I put more in between I'd either make the castle closer to Fellhaven or put more in between Fellhaven and the castle because that part was like a whole session that was kind of boring. And I've, if it takes so long to get, or it's, it's such a difficult thing to get all those people together on a, on a, a Saturday night. And it's like, I don't want to waste everyone's um, time. And of course, you know, I just mean that like you make every session count. You don't want to have a dud session where you're traveling between places unless there's something exciting happening. And while they did have one battle with the orcs and it was necessary, it did kind of feel like that was your vegetables in order to get to the dessert of the castle. Um, which, not to say the adventure should be all dessert, but that everything should have its merits. Anyway, that's my post-mortem of Malam's Maze. Um, I had a great time uh, playing playing it, I told everyone that next campaign, someone else DM, and not, you know, I was like, I, if they really want, I can DM again, but I'm very much wanting to play a, a character in the next campaign rather than DMing it, but I had a great time, um, and of course, I'm always writing more adventures, and I'm always going to be posting to Dungeon Workshop, because I, I uh, have a, as you can see over here, I have a problem with um, always trying, you know, getting... Paint models or thinking about quests and all that other stuff. But this was my first big campaign that was like, had a set goal, set, it could be repeatable, essentially, right? It wasn't unique to our certain circumstances, but was like, you out there watching this can take this adventure, modify it however you like, and run it um, in 5th edition D&D or in any edition of any kind of fantasy game. Um, and I, I'd love for anyone who tries it or even just simplifies it into a smaller session or whatever you do or takes elements of it, I'd love to hear feedback on it um, or ways that you would improve or change the adventure. Thanks for everyone who um, uh, kept watching all these series. I know it took a lot of videos. Um, also, thanks especially to uh, YouTuber J. Scott Garibay, um, who kind of prompted me to make video quests, right? A lot of people make videos about how to be a good DM, 
which is a popular topic, or DMing in general, but very few people actually put quests into video form for DMs and for people who either don't want to sit down and read a whole thing or sit down and create a whole thing, it's awesome to have a YouTube video playing in the background and essentially prep you for an adventure. Um, and I think we need to see more of those on, on YouTube. Um, so he, uh, he gave the name to it a vid quest. So, uh, thanks for that, Scott. And then, um, I, uh, We'll have videos coming up probably in a bit um, talking about the, n the next D&D adventure that I've been playing in, which I am DMing for, um, but it's not really a big campaign like Pyroth's, uh, like, like Malam's Maze. It's a, uh, a setting. So uh, I'll have more videos on that setting uh, that I call Emerald Blade setting or uh, the continent of Shinea, but... Um, Beyond that, um, this is the end of the uh, Malam's May series, so thank you all again. I'll see you in the next one.